Thank you, Lauren. Uh, uh, we're grateful to be with you, and uh, we appreciate this opportunity to talk about this report. So I'm old school, so I'll hold it up. It's a, a report of the Commission on Unalienable Rights. Um, many of you may not have heard of it. If, if so, I want to take a moment to introduce it to you. It was, it was released in July of this year, which was uh, an inauspicious time in one way because the country was uh, embroiled in, in uh, protests of various kinds as well as the COVID health crisis, the pandemic. So you may not be aware of it, but its subject is of perennial importance. Of course, um, Robert George and I both have been involved in human rights work in one way or another for decades. So I want to put this in the context, uh, in context using the commission's own introduction. So at the end of the Second World War, which was massively devastating worldwide and it caused the death of millions and millions, some estimates 50 million innocent people, so non-combatants who had been killed, uh, the world did a variety of things to try to make sure that we didn't have such a war again. Uh, they established the United Nations, and then in 1948, they issued the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so, uh, by some measures, that is the modern human rights, or the, the post-World War II, anyway, human rights project. And I'm, I'm sure most people listening are younger than I, so I, I want to just take a second to mention uh, what the report again says, is that we may have forgotten there have been some very notable successes of the human rights movement. For instance, the demise of apartheid in South Africa and the uh, Iron Curtain, which divided the world into free and communist. And the human rights ideal and the uh, invoking of the human rights standards were central to the demise of both uh, those regimes. But modern, in, in the last few decades or the last decade, there have been some serious challenges that have arisen. I'll mention a couple that the report itself mentions. One is the rise of China, which promotes a vision that does not include civil and political rights at all. They're subject to national uh, projects and need not be respected. And then I'll quote from the report, further erosion of the human rights project has resulted from widespread disagreement about the nature and scope of human rights, disappointment in the performance of international institutions, and overuse of rights language. More than half the world's population suffers under regimes where the most basic freedoms are systematically denied. At the same time, new risks to human freedom and dignity are emerging in the form of ra rapid technological advance advances such as uh, artificial intelligence, etc. So in the light of these challenges, the Secretary of State, Michael Pompeo, determined that it was time for an informed review of the role of human rights in foreign policy that serves American uh, interests, reflects American ideals, and meets the international obligations the United States has assumed. And to that end, he established the Commission on Unalienable Rights, and the chairman is the great human rights scholar and leader, uh, Harvard law professor Marianne Glendon. The commission's charge given by the secretary was, quote, not to discover new principles, but to furnish advice on the, to the secretary for the promotion of individual liberty, human equality, and democracy through U.S. foreign policy. Furthermore, the commission's advice was to be grounded in, in two found in two sources, the founding principles of this nation and the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I mentioned a second ago. So this is a, a kind of a specific charge. How can we reflect human rights based on the US, uh, US tradition as well as you, uh, international obligations and the Universal Declaration in U.S. foreign policy. 
I, I, we will talk probably more about certain aspects and conclusions of the commission, but I do want to mention kind of in summary that the, com the commission stated that like our fellow Americans, the undersigned commissioners are not of one mind on many issues uh, where there are conflicting arguments. But with hundreds of millions of men and women around the world suffering extreme forms of deprivation under harsh authoritarian regimes, we are of one mind. This was the conclusion they emphasized uh, several times in the public release of the document. We are of one mind on the urgent need for the United States to vigorously champion human rights in our policy. So the report, just to give you an overview and uh, to encourage you, if you haven't read it, of course, to get it and read it. I think that Faith and Law may circulate it to you, but if not, you can Google it under report on inalienable rights, or you can go to state.gov and find it there. The report is divided into uh, three major sections. The distinctive American rights tradition, U.S. commitments to international human rights principles, and human right, third section, human rights in U.S. foreign policy. So I'll turn it over to Professor George in just a second, but I, I do, I just want to mention that it is, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but unfortunate that this report was not closely examined and discussed because in one way its release in July was uh, auspicious because it has a very deep review, or not a very deep review, but it has a pretty good review of American history and American traditions, our distinctive traditional rights, and, and offers a variety of ways to think about rights, which would help this country quite a bit in the turmoil that we sometimes are undergoing. Um, so I would just say, let me say to Robbie, ask him, uh, if it's if it's if this is unfair, I'll supply it and then let you talk, Robbie. But the on the American distinctive American tradition, the report mentions that there are three kind of tr three traditions of rights that come together in America uniquely: um, civic republicanism, classical liberalism, and biblical faith. So with that, let me just bounce it over to you. Good. Well, thanks very much, uh, Bill. Let me begin by uh, thanking my friends at uh, Faith and Law. I've been able to appear as a guest at Faith and Law uh, in person several times, as well as um, uh, by Zoom on one previous occasion. And it's always a very great pleasure to get together with such fine people. I also want to say how much I uh, admire and want to support the work that Faith and Law is doing. That's why I always say yes when I'm invited to participate in Faith and Law activities, because what you're doing is so terribly important. Uh, right there uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, where the big issues are deliberated and where the big decisions are uh, made. Uh, so thank you and God bless you to all the folks at uh, Faith and Law, especially my dear old friend, Bill Wichterman, and uh, Lauren Noyes, of course. And Lauren, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction of uh, Professor Saunders and myself. Uh, and what a pleasure it is, uh, Bill, to be back together uh, with you. Um, Brother Saunders and I, uh, for participants, I should say, go back a very long way. Bill mentioned that uh, we've been involved in human rights work together for decades, uh, but we've uh, known each other uh, for, it seems like, millennia, uh, long before either of us was uh, dyeing his hair gray. Actually, when we were boys, uh, when we were boys, at least boys at Harvard Law School uh, uh, together. Uh, and we have worked formally together at the U.S. Commission on uh, Civil Rights, um, uh, where together we led the commission's inquiry into the free exercise of religion in American public schools. And we've continued to work over the years uh, together, although not uh, in the same institution, writing things together, uh, working in so many worthy causes uh, on behalf of the sanctity of human life, uh, marriage and the family, uh, religious liberty bills, the founder of a very uh, important charity that uh, helped at crucial moments uh, people in the Sudan, the persecuted Christians in the southern part of the Sudan, uh, who were so viciously uh, treated by those exercising uh, power over them. 
Um, Bill and I worked together on that charity. Bill actually uh, uh, traveled to Sudan uh, on more than one occasion to be with uh, those persecuted uh, Christian communities uh, and was even subject to a bombing raid when he was there. He showed enormous uh, physical as well as moral courage uh, in standing up on behalf of religious liberty. Bill and I both believe that religious liberty is religious liberty for all, uh, not just for Christians, not just for our fellow uh, Christians. In fact, it would be unchristian to suppose that religious liberty or any other human right was not a right for all. In fact, the very concept of human rights includes their universality. Human rights are rights we have not in virtue of any achievement of ours, not in virtue of any quality such as intelligence or strength or power or beauty or skill or charm, no. Human rights are rights human beings have simply in virtue of our humanity, which means that they are the rights of the weak as well as the strong, the vulnerable as well as the powerful, the poor as well as the rich, uh, the victim of any injustice. Human rights principles are principles of justice. To talk about human rights is to talk about justice. Now, uh, as has been pointed out by some critics of uh, rights talk, whether they are moderate critics, uh, such as Professor Marianne Glendon, the great um, um, chairman of the commission that produced this today, uh, or less moderate critics, sharper, uh, more radical critics like Joan Lockwood O'Donovan, it has been pointed out that we needn't use the language of human rights in order to make the claims of justice that it's important for us to make. There's no magic in the term right or rights. Uh, and there's a concern, and this is why the rights language or rights talk has critics, that rights language might imply a kind of individualism, a kind of radical individualism, which is incompatible with human solidarity. Indeed, the solidarity that is witnessed to and celebrated by Christianity, but also by Judaism, by Islam, by all of the great. Uh, traditions of the world, the great religious uh, traditions and philosophical uh, traditions. Uh, and yet for some of us, including moderate critics like Professor Glendon, there is still value in the language of rights because it's a language that does enable us in a compact way, in a supple way, to pinpoint principles of justice, ideas about justice that are critical to understand and to make claims on behalf of victims of injustice that are easy for people to uh, understand. Uh, as Bill pointed out, the report itself notes that uh, the language of rights, or at least the tradition of rights, the, the tradition that, that fed the report, uh, is not simply the one tradition we identify with enlightenment liberalism, as it's sometimes called. No, uh, there are other roots and sources often neglected. And uh, these roots and sources make important contributions to a sound understanding of rights and human rights. And these include the classical tradition, sometimes called civic republicanism, the tradition that, uh, that uh, more broadly uh, includes uh, important thinkers such as Plato and Aristotle, uh, the great Greek philosophers, the great Roman jurists, figures such as uh, Cicero, the tradition that's mediated to us uh, in part by the great thinkers of the medieval uh, period. And of course, the biblical tradition, Jerusalem as well as Athens. There is probably no moral foundation more critical to a sound understanding of human rights than the foundation that is provided in the very first chapter of the very first book of the Word of God, of the Bible. And that is the teaching that the human being, man, though made from the dust of the earth, made from nothing, is nevertheless fashioned in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of the universe, of God himself. There is a profound basis for the dignity of the human person and the equality of all persons. We are all brothers and sisters under the fatherhood of God. We are all equal in virtue of having been created in his image and likeness.
Now, when we uh, think about that, uh, Bill, for a moment, we understand that uh, what is God-like about us, making us subjects and not objects, indeed subjects of justice and human rights, and not mere instruments to be played with and destroyed or, or, or uh, uh, used at other people's whims, what makes us God-like, what gives us our dignity, is agency at least the radical capacity for agency, the capacity to develop, if all goes well, into creatures that exercise the godlike powers of reason and freedom. After all, uh, God does not have uh, a hair on his head and five fingers on each of two hands and a nose. We're not godlike in virtue of our physical makeup, although our physical makeup is an aspect of our very selves, not mere instrument or a, a suit of flesh we inhabit. And yet what is God-like about the human creature are precisely those capacities for reason and freedom. It's our sea, which sets us up apart from other terrestrial creatures. Even those uh, um, uh, animals of uh, impressive levels of intelligence, those non-human animals that can say, uh, learn 80 words, uh, although of course not uh, actually develop or use syntactical languages or actually uh, exercise what we would uh, recognize fully as as freedom of the freedom of the will. So uh, all of these uh, traditions have uh, I'll use the term again fed that metaphor fed the understanding of human rights that I think correctly the Commission on Unalienable Human Rights chaired by Professor Glendon is calling us back to. And Bill, I'll I'll, I'll close this part of the conversation just by saying why I think it was important for us to be called back to that understanding at the time. Uh, why did Secretary Pompeo ask Professor Glendon to chair a commission to rethink human rights? Why was that necessary? Well, it's because the discourse of human rights is now the dominant discourse of much of our discussion of justice. It's the dominant discourse at the State Department. It's the dominant discourse of uh, American foreign policy and international relations. If you look at the scholarly literature, if you look at the activist organizations, what is advocated for is advocated for in the name of human rights. Uh, what is opposed is always opposed in the name of human rights. Now, of course, people have conflicting ideas about human rights, what human rights there are, uh, what is for human rights, what is against human, human rights, but the language is now dominant. The discourse is a discourse of human rights. But such discourses, obviously, these moral discourses, uh, are easily hijacked. So once a discourse becomes dominant, everybody wants to pursue his or her agenda, for good or for ill, in the name of human rights. And human rights language can be used even to advance causes that are contrary to a sound, a morally sound understanding of justice, of human, of human rights. A hijacking of the discourse can occur. Uh, I, I uh, would ask you all to, to join me in praying for uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the great former chief rabbi of England, who uh, announced yesterday that he has been diagnosed with uh, cancer and is, is in care. Please join me in praying for him, who's a great champion of human rights, and who I'm invoking here and raising here because he makes a terribly important point that uh, it's good for us to remember in thinking about this report and human rights more generally, he made it in relation to the great ancient curse, the great evil, by great I'm not commending it, quite the contrary, the horrific evil of anti-Semitism. Uh, Rabbi Sachs says, you know, anti-Semitism is always justified in whatever the dominant moral discourse of the day is. It never goes away. It always seems to keep popping back up. Even when we think we've, we've killed it and buried it, Somehow, like a vampire, it comes back from the dead. And yet, whenever and wherever we find it, we find it justified and expressed in the dominant moral discourse of the day. In the Middle Ages, when theological discourse was the dominant discourse, 
anti-Semitism was expressed and justified theologically in Christian terms, for example. Uh, in the Enlightenment, when science and rationality are the dominant discourse, it's justified and expressed in terms of science. During the period of the rise of nationalism and the uh, construction of nation states, uh, it's justified and expressed in the name of uh, nationalism. And, and the Jews are represented as the rootless cosmopolitans who have no allegiance to the nation and therefore can't be trusted and who are, uh, who are a threat to the nation. Um, uh, and so in our own day, Rabbi Sachs points out, what is the dominant discourse? The dominant discourse is a discourse of human rights. And so sure enough, we find anti-Semitism justified in the language of human rights and expressed in that language. And my point here is that what Rabbi Sachs says about that one injustice, that one evil, anti-Semitism, is true more generally. Any evil will be justified in the terms of, in the discourse of, the dominant way of thinking and talking, the dominant discourse of the time. And so anything today can be justified in the name of human rights. That's what I think Secretary Pompeo and the report have in mind in trying to respond to the hijacking and call back human rights discourse to uh, a, a, an earlier, deeper, richer uh, understanding. So for example, you find abortion, the killing of unborn children, the deliberate lethal violence against the unborn, justified in the name of what? Human rights. Planned Parenthood and other uh, uh, abortion providers and organizations that lobby for and push abortion across the board, Amnesty International is another one, they justify, they express their uh, pro-abortion uh, agenda in terms of human rights. They have hijacked it. Actually, it's a violation of human rights. That's a fundamental thing that's wrong about abortion. It's the taking of an innocent human life in violation of the rights of the child in the womb. And yet, a hijacking has occurred because this is the dominant discourse. They'll justify abortion in those terms. Uh, with, with a group like Amnesty, you find the same thing with prostitution. <laughs> so now they're justifying prostitution, arguing for the elimination of prostitution laws around the world in the name of human rights. There's the hijacking. And that's why we needed the report to call us back to a better, richer, truer understanding of human rights. Uh, and that was the mission of the, uh, the Glendon Commission. And I think that uh, Professor Glendon and her commission did a very, very fine job of calling us back to the best traditions, especially putting the focus on the principles of the American founding and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the principles of the UN Declaration on Human Rights of 1948, two great achievements uh, in the domain of justice, uh, uh, both of which of course have profound significance for our own uh, American commitments. Uh, Ronnie, uh, I think it's interesting uh, in the uh, section on American traditions that I just read a sentence here. It says, foremost among the unalienable rights the government is established to secure, from the founder's point of view, are property rights and religious liberty. A political society that destroys the possibility of either loses its legitimacy. Now you, you might want to say, that doesn't mean a narrow idea of property rights. They're not talking about that. They, the report goes on to say that it's a, it's a, a broader idea of property rights. Um, but it, then the mention of religious liberty, I don't know if you want to reflect on that, but it, the report just reminds us of some of the great milestones in American history that are due to the courageous leadership of religious figures and figures who are insisting on religious liberty. Well, that's true. Um, it's very important that we recover and defend the American understanding of uh, religious liberty. Uh, and here I'm labeling it the American understanding to distinguish it, for example, from the French revolutionary understanding or the understanding that is embodied in the fruit of that, which is the French political doctrine uh, of separation of church and state known as laicite. The American understanding is not one, I emphasize, I underscore, I italicize, not one that relegates religion or religious people to the private domain. The American understanding of religious liberty does not say that religious liberty is simply freedom of worship. 
or the right to exercise your faith in the private precincts of the home or the church or the synagogue or the mosque or the, or the temple. It's not just, it pertains not just to what you do at a liturgy or what you do around the table at dinner time or what you do on your knees at bedtime. No, it includes the right, includes, not just allow, includes the right, part of your religious liberty is the right to bring your religiously inspired convictions about justice and the common good into the public square and to vie there uh, for the allegiance of your fellow citizens with other people's perspectives, whether religiously informed or secular, whether, whether they come from a tradition of faith or they represent utilitarianism or some other secular or liberal, liberal expressive individualism or some contemporary secular uh, ideology. Um, one of the, one of the, I think, um, most influential streams of what goes by the label liberalism in our lifetimes, probably the most influential stream, is one that claimed, I think in the end, uh, indefensibly, uh, to be simply establishing a neutral public square in which different views could compete, but in which it itself, that is liberalism, was not a contestant, but rather simply functioned as an umpire. Uh, and I think that, for, for example, that's a view of liberalism that's the kind of liberalism that was advanced by the late and very great uh, Professor John Rawls, the Harvard political philosopher. But I think that uh, that was a failed effort uh, because uh, even Rawls, for all his acumen, could not uh, find a way to avoid smuggling in, even to his own theory, substantive ideas about human nature, the human good, human dignity, and human destiny, which uh, falsified the claim of quote, political liberalism, unquote, to be a purely political doctrine with no substantive moral content that, that functioned as a kind of umpire um, in a game in which all the other competing comprehensive views, liberal, uh, secular or religious, uh, could, could fairly compete. Uh, no, it was the umpire actually <laughs> functioning as, as pitcher, but calling his own balls and strikes. And predictably, uh, you, you get 27 batters up, 20 seven batters down each on three strikes. Um, so I think we're right to reject that kind of liberalism, certainly reject it as a foundation for human rights. I think the sort of foundational theories, uh, that amalgam of theories that the Human Rights uh, Commission, or the Unalienable Rights Commission report uh, looks to, the civic republican tradition, the biblical tradition, enlightenment, the mix is the way to go. Let's find the best uh, let's have these theories engage each other. Let's work with the resources that we can find in these traditions to put together the soundest, best understanding of human rights and then make our foreign policy exemplify and carry out that vision of human rights. Now, to do that, the Commission on Human Rights emphasized that we need to stay focused on the basic human rights, the most basic human rights, the uh, uh, what are sometimes referred to as the non-derogable rights that have been accepted by the international community and are contained in the crucial documents to which the U.S. and most other nations have signed on, have become uh, signatories. So things like uh, freedom of religion at the foundation, freedom of speech, uh, the right of conscience and uh, the right of assembly, the right of uh, protest, uh, the right of fair procedures in criminal um, uh, matters, uh, due process of law, the right to fundamental equality, these kinds of things. You know, uh, Robbie, uh, as we've mentioned, uh, part of the reason for the issuance of the report was there are certain threats to the human rights project, human rights properly understood in the ways you've just been discussing. Um, the last time I was on uh, Faith and Law, and I, I enjoyed it greatly, I was with one of the great uh, champions of human rights in for China, which is Chen Guangqin. And some of the people listening today may have been on that broadcast, uh, that uh, broadcast as well. And China is a major threat um, to the human rights project. Guangqin always emphasizes, and we talked about it last time, about how the COVID crisis was <laughs> exponentially made worse 
by the Chinese Communist Party. So he points out that you can't pretend that you can just ignore China. It, it is not just a threat, the Chinese Communist Party, it's not just a threat to itself, but to everybody. So it poses a threat to everybody's human right. Oh, so I don't know if about it. I mean, it's one of the most massively powerful organizational entities on the face of the globe, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, yes, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very serious threat. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you don't need me to tell you about it. You have a genuine witness, the very one that you, uh, that you invoked, the, the famous barefoot lawyer, the great human rights champion, Chen Guangcheng. I mean, we need to listen. We in America need to listen to his voice. Yeah, he just, shows the expansionist plans. He's, he's, he's under no illusions. And he's speaking out very uh, boldly about the expansionist plans of the Chinese communist uh, regime for a kind of domination of, of Asia, uh, a political as well as, uh, as economic. And another great hero in this struggle is Bob Fu who's currently being targeted here in the United States by yes. thugs Christian representing Pastor. the Communist Party uh, in, in, in China. Uh, this is a serious business. Uh, we, at our peril, we take China, uh, fail to take China seriously. Um, yeah, also, true. of course, there's a threat to the particular minority groups, um, uh, uh, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, uh, Christian in China, who are system, and even the Falun Gong, uh, systematically oppressed by the regime. And the regime is just the party bill. That, that's what the regime is. It's the Chinese Communist Party. Right. So uh, U.S. foreign policy, we want a moral U.S. foreign policy. We, we can't be blind to those kind of things and uh, excuse it by realism, because even by some kind of realist cal calculus, it would be foolish. Uh, I think it's just, I'll say just quickly on, you know, about Guangxin. It's interesting for me. He is a blind man, as you say, and he was first an advocate for the rural poor, yeah. and they kicked him around. Then he was an advocate for the handicapped or the disabled, and they kicked him around for that because he's causing trouble. And, you know, uh, the communist bureaucrats are only really into it for their own gain. And then finally, he raised the, uh, he told the truth about the one-child policy and the enforcement of it. Uh, through forced abortions, and that was the kind of straw that broke the camel's back, and they threw him in prison. The point is, of course, he's a hero. He's a true hero. But it, for the people listening, this regime is a terrible threat to its own people, to different ethnic groups, as Robbie said, but to us as well, because it, it denies even the premise that there are basic human rights. But there are, there are uh, uh, regimes, there are um, terrible human rights violating regimes that will speak in the language of human rights. Here the great example is Iran. You know, and, and here anti-Semitism is a good example. I mean, the, the regime in Iran spews out anti-Semitism and does so in the name of human rights. Uh, often it's all characterized as a critique of Israel, but they barely conceal that what their real problem is 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 not the policies, the particular policies of the Israeli government. Their real problem is with Jews as such. They drove their own Jewish community, of course, out of uh, Iran, an historic and very important uh, community that had made enormous contributions uh, to uh, Iranian uh, society and, and, and culture. Uh, but of course, uh, the, uh, the, the Iranian regime is a uh, equal opportunity oppressor. They oppress a lot of other people, including maybe their fellow Muslims, including their fellow Shiite Muslims as well. Yeah, you know, one thing uh, I'd like to mention, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Lauren is going to come in in a couple of minutes with some questions from the audience, and I imagine one of the questions will be, uh, when we're looking at human rights, how do we, uh, oh, Lauren is there now. Are you ready with some questions? Should I should I just let you go there, Lauren? <laughs> Whatever you want. We we are we have plenty of questions from the audience. I'm happy to delve into those now if you'd like. Yeah, why don't you? I think no, I uh, I think I know know where your question was going though, and let me give you a brief answer to what I think your question was. I'm, I'm trying so to. We read know it. each other so well. You can. Uh, I think I can read my own. <laughs> uh, it, it's important to see philosophically. So if we can turn to sort of my own area of of professional work uh, to philosophy, philosophy of law. It's important to understand that, that human rights, although they are true, there are true human rights, no question about that. Uh, 
they are not foundational moral principles. They are moral principles, they're not foundational. Uh, what rights do, what human rights do, are protect human goods. So they protect the truth-seeking project of, uh, of religion. So they protect the right of a person to search for religious truth, uh, to answer the great religious questions, the great questions of meaning and value, the great existential questions in an honest way, and then to attempt to live with integrity, authentically in line with his or her best judgment of truth, whether that is a Christian judgment or a Muslim judgment or a secular or even an unbeliever or an atheistic judgment. Even the atheist has the right to religious freedom. That applies equally to everybody. I can't emphasize that point strongly enough. Atheists have the same religious freedom rights that you and I uh, uh, have. And this is true of human rights more generally. Uh, the right to life protects the good of human life. Uh, the, the right to freedom of speech protects our capacity to look for truth and to speak the truth as best we understand the truth. That same right of freedom of expression as the great um, uh, constitutional theorist Alexander Mickel John years ago pointed out, that, that great right of freedom of speech is essential to the maintenance of Republican democracy. We can't run the good thing, Republican democracy, in which we all participate in self-government. We can't run that unless people are able to communicate with each other freely and truly speak their minds. So in understanding human rights, remember, they're not what's at the absolute bottom of the chain of reasoning. At the bottom are the human, the aspect of human well -being, aspects of human well-being and fulfillment that are protected by rights. End of sermon. Well, thank you so much for this really interesting discussion. I was just thinking back to a faith and law session we had um, a few weeks ago, where he really talked about in our culture today, how language and words have become considered violence and violent action. And you know, in this discussion of discourse, I'm curious if you could speak to that a little bit because simply language and, and the freedom of speech um, has become violence and has, uh, people are not allowed to say certain things anymore. Um, can you address that a little bit in our society? I sure can, that's a grave danger. It is undermining the truth-seeking mission of universities, as well as the mission of universities to teach students. Uh, it's facilitating indoctrination and indoctrination not only isn't teaching, it's antithetical to teaching. In a certain sense, it's the anti, it's the opposite of, of teaching. So uh, if we want our universities as we should to be truth-seeking institutions, institutions that, that sponsor and promote truth-seeking scholarship and non-indoctrinating teaching, we're going to have to cover the commitment that we once had to freedom of speech for everybody. Uh, and that, as, as John Stuart Mill very astutely pointed out in the 19th century, that freedom of speech that's so critical for the truth-seeking enterprise, as well as for the democratic enterprise, that, that freedom of speech that is so critical can be uh, undermined in two ways. One is by political authority. So people with political power, whether it's in general, like the presidents and heads of nations, or whether it's power within an institution like a university, like the president of the university or the trustees or the faculty governing board or the faculty senate or whatever it is, those political uh, uh, players can uh, uh, squash freedom of speech. But there's another way, this was Mill's astute insight. It's a very insidious way, and that is the freedom of speech can be squashed by the tyranny of public opinion, where uh, uh, it becomes impossible for people in a circumstance of groupthink uh, to um, survive with their relationships and opportunities and liberties intact if they question the prevailing dogmas. And as we have seen, <laughs> secularism is, if anything, at least the sort of progressive secularism that uh, is dominant in universities today is, if anything, more militant and fundamentalist and intolerant than religious uh, traditions ever uh, uh, managed to be, at least in our own uh, lifetimes, I mean, if you go back uh, into the centuries, you'll find the equivalent. But uh, speech can be, and even thought, can be repressed really quite brutally by the tyranny of, of, of public opinion. And, and it's really important for all of us, whether we are religious or secular, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, whatever we are, to stand up for everybody's right to free speech, not just our own, everybody else's.
and to stand up for that right as a right not only against political authority coming in and prohibiting speech, but against the tyranny of public opinion. And the way you do that, I think the best way to protect free speech rights is for us all to exercise them. We can undermine the groupthink and the dogmas, uh, the, the tyranny of public opinion, by simply questioning it, having the courage to stand up, speak out, question those dogmas. If enough of us do it, it's going to be impossible for them to, uh, uh, to continue to enforce these uh, dogmas, even by informal mechanisms. And what really worries me today, Lauren, is that it has gotten even worse in the last couple of years than it was in the previous few decades. We, we saw this was sometimes went by the name political correctness, this tyranny of, of, of public opinion, especially in elite academic institutions. We saw this doing its damage to the truth-seeking enterprise and to the teaching enterprise. But it was basically prohibitions on people saying what they believed to be true, if what they believed to be true was contrary to a prevailing dogma. In the last couple of years, I've witnessed something new, and it's even worse, and that is uh, the enforcers of these dogmas are not satisfied now simply to stop other people from saying what they believe is true. They've taken the additional step of trying to force them to say things that are not true or that they believe not to be true. I, I sometimes put it this way, ordinary authoritarians are content to just stop people from saying things that, that go contrary to the established uh, rules. Totalitarians take that extra step. What makes you a totalitarian is you take the extra step. You're not content simply to stop people from speaking their minds. Now you force them to say things they don't believe. And you do that, as every tyrant back to Stalin knows, you do that because you know if you make them say it often enough, they will come to believe it. The, the, the cognitive dissonance that's created, the rational pressure for consistency that we all have in our heads, will force you to adjust your own feelings and adjust your own thoughts to be in compliance with what you are outwardly saying. And this is why we need heroes. We need courageous people, the Havels, the Solzhenitsyns. Uh, we need uh, people who will stand up and speak out and say, no, I'm not going along with it. I'm not going to be forced to say something that I don't believe, and I'm not going to be forced to not say what I do believe. What word. All right. To the questions of the audience, professors George and Saunders, both of you clearly admire Marianne Glendon, the chair of the commission you were discussing today. Could you please tell us about her impact on you personally and in the world of human rights? What is it about her that makes her such an important figure? Professor Saunders has dedicated a recent book to her, and I believe that she will be speaking at the James Madison program this spring. Yes, I think Robbie and I could go on and on about her. Um, and um, I'll just say a bit and then let Robbie go on a bit more. Uh, but she is just a great champion. She's dedicated herself to the cause of human rights. She's been an ambassador, uh, et cetera. But for me as a lawyer, again, <clears throat> Robbie and I went to law school together and the disciplined way in which she approaches something like human rights, and she takes the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which you know, can be criticized, it's not perfect, da, 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 da. But she focuses on what's positive about it, which is it sets out some of these fundamental rights. It was an agreement for the whole world at a time of terrible worldwide suffering. So let's build on it. And I, I admire her positive way of doing that and her uh, standing up for a consistent witness on human rights um, for the, all the voices. Yes, I certainly agree with all that. She's a magisterial uh, figure. Uh, she is a, is, a, is a person who has uh, attained the highest uh, levels of, of scholarship. Uh, her work is always characterized by depth, thoughtfulness, as well as uh, analytical uh, rigor. She has been bold and brave in speaking her mind, even though she dissents from the uh, secular progressive orthodoxy. She's a Christian Catholic woman, uh, scholar at Harvard Law School. She's never let anyone silence her or intimidate her. Uh, she, she treats others with dignity and respect. Uh, she engages in civil debate and discourse, but she will not allow herself to be silenced or to be treated uh, disrespectfully, she expects. Uh, others to treat her as she 
uh, treats them. She's set, she's been an amazing role model for people like me. Um, and, 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 and even more, I think, for young women, uh, aspiring scholars and activists in the human rights field and in other fields, uh, who, for whom she is the living emblem of the fact that you don't have to buy into the whole secular progressive agenda, that ideology, in order to be a first-rate intellectual, first-rate scholar and achieve the highest level of attainment uh, in, in the academic world. Uh, also, if I can speak personally, she's, she's, my, she's been my big sister since I was a very young scholar. She took me under her wing. Uh, she, she advised me. She looked after me. She prayed for me. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm responsible for the few gray uh, hairs she has because uh, when I was coming up for tenure at uh, Princeton and speaking out very um, um, imprudently, uh, you might say about the sanctity of human life and marriage as the conjugal union of husband and wife and these other uh, issues that were just in defiance of the uh, views of most of my colleagues who would be, all of my colleagues who would be voting in my tenure case. Uh, she pleaded with me to, to tone it down, to not speak out as much. And unfortunately, I don't have a temperament that allows me to uh, do that. So I was unable to take her uh, advice. And I know she suffered for that because she was so worried. But uh, she has been such a dear friend and such a good advisor and such a great big sister, and like a godmother uh, uh, to me. And I just have the highest respect. And as you're the questioner, uh, noted, we will be uh, hearing her at the James Madison program at Princeton. In fact, more than hearing her, we'll be honoring her. Uh, she retired from Harvard uh, this year. Uh, she turned 80 years old and decided that she would take emerita status, emeritus status. And she um, will be uh, honored with our James Q. Wilson Award uh, for distinguished uh, uh, scholarly uh, contributions at the conference hosted by the James Madison program uh, together with the um, uh, foundation, uh, uh, what, an independent foundation that promotes scholarship in the area of free institutions, uh, which will actually be the sponsor of the award. We'll be co-sponsoring uh, this conference in her honor in May, assuming that we're uh, out of this pandemic and we can all uh, get together. But I, 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 like Bill, I can't say enough about the importance of uh, Mary Ann Glendon and what a amazing, wonderful person she is. And remind us of the book that she has written that you would recommend we all read? Yes, on this particular topic, of course, all her books are important and valuable, but on this particular topic, she wrote the book on the UN Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. It's called A World Made New, and it's a fascinating story. It reads like a novel. She's a great writer, uh, and it's about the committee that came together from different traditions of, of faith and philosophy, uh, to, to hammer out the terms of the UN Declaration in the wake of World War II and the Holocaust, to try to put the world on a better footing where we could um, at least honor to the extent that the international community has any influence, the principle of the equal and dignity of each and every member of the human family. And um, what, next question is actually kind of related to Holocaust. Um, Professor George, what's an example of anti-Semitism being expressed in the language of human rights? What does that sound like? Uh, yeah, again, I'll go back to the Iranian regime. So if you look at the stuff coming out of Tehran, uh, some, of, some of which is very usefully translated by some American uh, sources that, that keep track of, of, uh, of the rhetoric from that regime, which is uh, a sponsor of terror. If you look at their uh, rhetoric, uh, you, you will see the language of human rights being abused in order to vilify Jews. Everything is the fault of the Jews. Uh, sometimes they, they're, they're a little more careful and try to frame it just as a critique of Israeli government policy, but they're not good even at hiding the anti-Semitism that's uh, barely veiled uh, in those kinds of, uh, kinds of claims. It's the devious, allegedly devious uh, Jewish international conspiracy, the Zionists who are responsible for all the suffering in the Arab and more broadly in the, in the Muslim world. And so they try to rile up uh, anti-Semitism among their own people, among the broader Muslim community. Uh, and, and fortunately, at to, and to their great credit, there are Muslim leaders who 
condemn this and, and speak out about it and expose what the uh, regime in Tehran is doing when it comes to um, uh, promoting anti-Semitism precisely in the name of human rights. Okay, we are going to ask one last question. You have about 30 seconds to answer it, um, or maybe a minute. How would you explain human rights in relation to persons who lack the agency of rationality? Okay, if you, uh, uh, here I can refer you to a book that I've written with uh, my friend Christopher Tollefson called Embryo, A Defense of Human Life. And what we say there about uh, the child developing in the womb at the early stage, earliest stages of development apply equally uh, to uh, severely cognitively, co congenitally cognitively disabled persons uh, or to persons who are suffering from advanced dementias, Alzheimer's disease and other advanced uh, dementias. They do not abandon their humanity, they do not lose their humanity. They are still the kinds of creatures who are organized for rationality and freedom. They bear the radical capacity, that is the root capacity, for precisely those qualities. Uh, uh, That's why we regard it, even those who are pro-abortion generally at least, regard it as a terrible thing, a, a scandal, a horror, to kill uh, a two-year-old child, even though a two-year-old child isn't yet, uh, uh, hasn't yet attained what we call the, the age of reason, or even a, even a, a, a newborn child uh, who isn't yet at some levels functioning like a mature dog or rabbit. Still, we see that that creature, that newborn child or the two-year-old or the cognitively disabled person is not in the same relationship to rationality and agency that uh, that uh, that you have with a rabbit or a dog, which is not organized for rationality. It's not that something's gone wrong with the rabbit or the dog, which in principle could be corrected or miraculously could be corrected. You change a horse into a talking horse, you haven't perfected him as a horse. You've turned him into a completely different kind of a creature. That's why there are no talking horses. But if you can correct, say, what we used to call a birth defect, or through some genetic uh, intervention, for example, uh, overcome a form of uh, cognitive disability, you haven't changed that creature into a different thing than what he is. He's still the human being, a human being, the same human being he was. You perfected him as the kind of thing he is. So the ground of our dignity is not in the immediately exercisable capacities for rationality, judgment, choice, agency. Rather, it's in the radical capacity. It's the capacity to develop to the point where you can exercise those capacities. And if that's the kind of thing you are, if that's to use the old philosophical uh, term, the substance, the Aristotelian term, if that's the substance of what you are, that doesn't change with your ability, ability or inability immediately to exercise them. I mean, if you're in a coma or under anesthesia during an operation, uh, or if you're asleep, you, you haven't lost your right to life or any of your other rights.